Right. Great, thank you, um, Lubna, and thank you everyone and welcome. Um, I think we were initially talking about how much pressure it is to be the first subcommittee to go, but I guess I'm pretty excited to be here with all of you. Um, I wasn't thinking about the pressure, I was thinking about the opportunity to hear from all of you. Um, uh, my name is Natalie Eddy. I'm the Air Quality Liaison with the Environmental Justice, um, Act, uh, Environmental Justice Unit. Forgetting all of the acronyms, try not to say them and then I get mixed up in my alphabet soup. And so we're here today um, for the first of, and there, there, I guess I should back up and say that there are um, four subcommittees that were decided upon um, at the first Environmental Justice Action Task Force meeting in um, December. And so this is the first meeting of one of those subcommittees. The other subcommittees are equity analysis, um, data and health disparities, uh, definition of disproportionately impacted communities. And then this one that we are all here today for is um, to discuss and consider best practices for community engagement. I sort of feel like this is the part on, on the plane when the pilot says, if you don't wanna go to Phoenix, this is your chance to hop off. So this is this is best practices for community engagement. Um, I hope that's all what you were expecting to talk about today. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, Lubna, just in terms of how we kind of roll out today, should we do a bit of round of introductions? So we have we have two hours today and I can all kind of go into the agenda, but maybe we just start off with, um, get a sense of who's in the room. And I think there may be a few more folks who are um, who will be joining in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, Natalie, maybe we can combine that with our, um, with our like icebreaker question. We can have folks kind of introduce themselves and then, um, provide a response to the to the icebreaker question of what brings you joy? Sure, let's start with that then. Thanks, thanks for the reminder. Let's see, so I will, um, I, as I said, I'm the Air Quality Liaison with the Environmental Justice Unit with CDPHE. Um, I started back in July. I have um, the great joy of living in Leadville up in the high mountains. And um, one of the things that brings me joy is um, uh, being part of this pretty wonderful community and um, running around outside with my kids. And so this last weekend was a lot of ski racing and hanging out with um, fun families and friends outside um, in a way that we really haven't done much of for, for a couple of years now. So it was kind of a... Um, brought me lots of joy to be with other folks and play outside in the sun, in the snow, um, was a, my happy place. Uh, let's see, maybe we'll go, should I kind of just go in order on the screen and then it'll be a little bit more back and forth between staff and community members and task force? That sounds great. Great, let me, um, let's see, Mara, you are up in my upper right corner if you wanna start. And I guess people, if you are part of the, um, uh, Environmental Justice Action Task Force, please let us know so that we kind of, so if they're public, members of the public on, they understand kind of the different roles and different hats that we're playing, that we're wearing here. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, my name is Mara Brosi Wichar. I'm part of the Environmental Justice Action Task Force, um, and I uh, run uh, government affairs uh, for Onward Energy, which is a renewable energy company based here in Denver. Um, what brings me joy? Um, truly, uh, cooking and baking. I have a side business of baking pies. And so um, it's a little known fact about me. Um, and uh, yeah, that brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dominique. If you'd like to go next. Dominique, are you there? I know, I know just... that she, she said that she was going to be off camera while she's eating lunch. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's see. How about Rosario Rusi? Hello, everyone. I'm Rosario. I'm uh, the translation and interpretation specialist with the Environmental Justice Unit. And I joined the unit uh, back in mid uh, November. And uh, 
what brings me joy, uh, pretty much movement. It can be indoors, outdoor, it can be any type of movement and also being outdoors, being connected to nature and that can take any form or shape as well. And, uh, and also what brings me a lot of joy is other people's choice. I'm a very um, empathetic type of person, so. Thank you, Rosario. Um, let's, can we go back to Dominique? Sorry about that, I think I picked a bad time. Sorry, I was just grabbing some lunch and uh, yeah, I'm right here, but uh, I'm Dominique Gomez. I'm with the Colorado Energy Office. Um, and let's see, what brings me joy is uh, being outside and spending time with my family. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Kelly Crandall. Oh, hi everyone. I'm Kelly. I'm with the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. I'm not actually on the task force. Uh, Director Doug Dean is our task force representative and I believe he's on some other subcommittees. So I'm just here listening today. Um, thank you for letting uh, members of the public listen. Um, and I would say my cat is what's giving me joy lately. We adopted a, a new cat, a, about a year ago, and she is just the sweetest thing and a great addition to our household. Wonderful, thanks Kelly, glad you can join us today. Um, Ilda. Hi folks, uh, Ilda Nusete, I'm the Director of Civic Engagement with uh, the Legal Conservation Voters. I am a member of the Task Force and also the Co-Chair for the Health Equity Commission. Um, something that made me kind of join this committee is really, I, been organizing in the Latino community um, for uh, almost a decade now, and especially in the environmental sector and seeing so many missed opportunities and things that can be sort of really mistranslated um, culturally or even mistranslated in a regular terms in, in our community and, and sort of what it can affect when it comes to engaging and people being bought into the process, but also trusting of the individuals driving the process. Um, and something that brings me joy, uh, I recently moved into my new apartment, which is quite nice, and it takes forever to just like get things out of boxes and not look super chaotic. I still got to hate painting why my wall seems so empty, but, um, and that's something that's giving me joy, just a new space, new energy, feels good. Wonderful, thank you, Ilda. Um, let's see, uh, Jamie Valdez, are you available to speak? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Valdez, or Jaime. I go by either. I'm used to, I've grown up getting used to both, so um, I don't necessarily have a preference. I'm a community organizer for Mothers Out Front, which is a mother-founded, mother-led climate justice organization. Um, and I've been working for uh, environmental justice and social equity for quite some time with um, Mothers Out Front as well as the other organizations, including Green Latinos and the Sierra Club and others. So um, I'm happy to be here uh, working to advance that same cause. Thanks so much, glad you can join us. Um, let's see, can we hear from uh, Marsha Nelson, please? Sure, um, Marsha Nelson here, um, the new chief equity officer um, as a part of the, uh, for the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, so I fall under the uh, Senate Bill 260 um, under their newly formed branch called Equity and Environmental Justice. Um, also a part of the EJ Task Force and excited to be here to hear different perspectives uh, what gives me joy? I, there's a lot of things that give me joy. Food, for one. I mean, I love food. I love to eat. Um, but for me, something that really, truly gives me joy is working with youth. Um, I love being able to share my knowledge and my experience to help support our growing youth, um, because I believe representation matters, right? And oftentimes, many students don't have the opportunity to see someone of their like um, in an opportunity where they can grow as well. So anytime I can work with youth as a mentor, as a tutor, whatever it is, gives me a lot of joy. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us today, Marsha. Um, Kimberly. 
Did we just did we just lose her? Perhaps. Um, uh, Lupna and Joel, would you like to introduce yourselves and keep going around? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Lubna Ahmed, the Environmental Justice Boards Manager. Um, and what is bringing me joy most recently is um, spending time with my niece and nephew um, who are here in Denver. Um, my nephew is just pulling out of the, um, the temper tantrum age and is, is like kind of leveling out now. So it's been a joy to uh, hang out with him recently. Joel? Hi everyone, I'm Joel Miner. I'm the manager of the Environmental Justice Unit here at CDPHE. So I get to work with Natalie and Lumna and our Rosario. You get to see our, our whole team today. Um, something that is bringing me joy right now, I, I love reading, um, especially science fiction and fantasy books. And I just got a, a book from the library that I've been waiting for called Blue Skin Gods by S. Jason Dewey that I'm really excited about. So it's done a lot of my weekend reading. Thanks so much, Joel. I think we have um, uh, Margot Pickett, who I think is a member of the public who's joining us today. Hi, yeah. Um, so I uh, live in Longmont um, and I'm a member of First Congregational um, United Church of Christ of Boulder. And we have in the last year and a half started a climate action team and um, become a creation justice church. I'm on the subcommittee that is supposed to be looking especially at environmental justice and how we can be involved. Um, and somebody from the NAACP in Boulder forwarded the email from y'all and um, I may not be on the, on the right Zoom meeting, but one of the issues that we're trying to figure out is how as a predominantly white congregation, we can be involved in environmental justice, um, who we can partner with, what we can, how we can find our place um, in that. And I live in Longmont because that's where our grandchildren are and they bring me great joy. Wonderful, welcome Margo. I think, I, I think you're absolutely on the right Zoom. I'm glad you're here and, and here part of the conversation. This is our first meeting. And so we'll talk more about how we hear from um, community members who join this, but this is a public meeting. We are recording this meeting and um, we're, we're really um, thankful that you're here, so welcome. Thank you. Um, we also have a CDPG colleague, Erin Garcia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Erin Garcia. I am a communication specialist and I primarily work in the water quality control division, but I've had the pleasure of working with Joel and Natalie and others on a lot of environmental justice activities and efforts that they've got going on. So um, they invited me to attend today and I'm just grateful to be here to uh, listen in and learn. Wonderful. Thanks for thanks for being here, Erin. So I think we, if I'm if I'm right, maybe correct me, Lubna. I think we haven't heard yet from from Kimberly Cook or um, Jonathan Asher. So maybe if they hop on, or we'll take a pause and make sure they have a chance to introduce themselves, and we can go ahead and get started. Yeah, that sounds great. Kimberly's having some connectivity issues, um, okay. and Jonathan said he'd just be um, jumping on a few minutes late. He got pulled into a meeting um, with the governor's office. Okay. Should we go ahead and start with the slides then? Are you able to project those or should I? Um, yeah, whatever's easiest for you. Do, you. do you want me to share my screen and do it that way? That would be great if you don't mind. Yeah. All right, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, thanks. That works for me. Um, so we have a, um, a little less, a little bit about an hour and a half together. Um, this is, as you know, the first of this subcommittee meeting focused on best practices for community engagement, but also the first of the subcommittee meetings for the Environmental Justice Action Task Force. So um, we are going to likely learn some lessons here and ways we can strengthen um, these conversations. But we really appreciate the chance to be with all of you. Um, 
here today. Next slide. So just kind of a quick overview of um, how we're gonna approach the agenda today. Um, what I'd like to do is spend, I think a little less than an hour going through some of the provisions of Colorado's Environmental Justice Act that are specific to um, community engagement and looking at what are the, how are those best practices for community engagement in, um, defined. Um, and then as we kind of go through those definitions to share per, my preliminary experience um, seven months in as air quality liaison in, in terms of convening. Um, but also I, I really hope this can sort of start a dialogue with all of you to think about um, what additional information will be valuable for you all as the sub subcommittee um, on best practices for uh, community engagement. And then I think the second half of the meeting, we can talk more about how the subcommittee wants to work together going forward and kind of we, we've we mapped out a bit of a, a calendar and some um, agendas for your consideration, but really for your for your response and, and input. And so we hope we can leave this meeting today with a sense of, you know, what what is, in, what is community engagement? How is it defined? And what are the expectations set out in the Environmental Justice Act? Um, what has experience looked like thus far? And, and what more information does this committee need in order to prepare recommendations um, in preparation for the, the report that this, um, sub, this subcommittee will prepare as part of the broader task force um, report in November. And then also what else, you know, what's missing and what if anything can, can I and other staff members within the environmental justice unit um, work to gather more information in, in response to questions from this. Uh, I should say also, we will be electing a chair at the end of this meeting. And so um, that's something for you all to consider in terms of possible interest. We will, we will invite you to either self-nominate or nominate each other, and we'll share what that process looks like when we get there. Just taking a look, maybe can we stay for, at the agenda for a second? Sorry. Any, any kind of questions or other expectations or issues you are hoping or expecting out of today's conversation? Okay. Natalie, um, I have one question just real quickly and, yes, and I apologize. Um, I was wondering also just, are we going to talk sort of about um, our goals as well in within the Environmental Justice Act. I know that there's some some pretty specific things that, that it talks about in terms of reporting and things like that. And will this committee be putting forth those suggestions within the report and, and sort of what are our goals as a subcommittee? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great starting place. So, so maybe I can set the stage for that and see if this gets the level of specificity. But I, but I think over the course of today's conversation, absolutely, we wanna kind of clarify that. Um, both clarify what are the goals or what is the what is the task at hand for the subcommittee and and then start thinking about what more information does the subcommittee need in order to make those recommendations and and contribute the um, community engagement portion of the report for November. And just to summarize in terms of I would say that the charge of this um, subcommittee based on the provisions and um, the the call to action by, um, by the Environmental Justice Act is, is threefold. Uh, the first is the subcommittee is really invited to review the best practices that are articulated in the act. And I'm gonna go through those one by one. And so we'll, we'll spend most of the, I think this first 45 minutes going into those details and, and having a conversation about this. Um, so taking a look at those best practices and, and figuring out are those, are, are, are those what we want um, to go forward in Colorado or do they need to be adjusted or, or um, revised? The second piece is I would say taking into account some of the experiences we're having. So I would say I'm as the air quality liaison and um, these provisions are focused on the air quality um, control commission. And so we're looking, we're focused primarily on air as the, as the first step for the Environmental Justice Act. So I would like to be able to share um, experience and feedback and community input with this committee to take into consideration um, your recommendations and uh, your report going forward. 
And uh, the other question that the Environmental Justice Act put, puts forward to, to the entire Environmental Justice Action Task Force, as well as the subcommittee is, you know, should some or all of these best practices be applied to other agencies beyond the Air Quality Control Commission? And, and what would that look like? Great, thank you, appreciate that. So if that sort of helps set the stage of, of why we're here and, and where we're headed, hopefully that's helpful. And I guess I would just pause and see if, if uh, Lubna and Joel have any other um, pieces you'd like to jump in on if, I, if I'm skipping anything that's kind of fundamental. I don't think so, Natalie. I think you covered it pretty well. Um, and just reiterating that we're gonna be we're going to be having each of these subcommittee meetings um, over the next couple of weeks, and then we'll come together as a larger task force again in February. Our meeting scheduled for the 22nd, and you all should have those calendar invitations. Um, but you know, just keeping in mind for this meeting in particular, we are focusing on specifically best practices for community engagement, and when we're thinking about goals and objectives, um, which we can definitely make clear here. Um, those are specific to this subcommittee, and then we'll kind of share that with the rest of the group and see how we can kind of have it come together as we are developing the environmental justice statewide agency wide plan um, as a as a task force as a whole. So. Great, thanks, Lubna. And then if we can go on to the next slide. So before kind of diving into some of the more mechanical pieces of, of the definitions of some of these best uh, practices definitions within the Environmental Justice Act, I, I wanted to start with just, um, I think the really exciting and, and challenging ambition that is set forth in the Environmental Justice Act. And so first, um, yeah, before we look into these mechanics, I just want to flag, and this is, um, language taken verbatim from the Environmental Justice Act of you know, what is the goal of um, outreach to and engagement of disproportionately impacted communities. And so there are three pieces to it. Um, first, to build trust and transparency with disproportionately impacted communities. Second is to provide meaningful opportunities to influence public policy. And then third is to modify proposed state action in response to received public input to decrease environmental burdens and increase environmental benefits for each disproportionately impacted community. I mean, I think this, this slide and this provision with the Environmental Justice Act is so exciting because the, the trust and transparency is fundamental. And then what it's really looking forward, looking and calling us to do is to um, influence public, public policy, bring about change in such a way that decreases harm and disproportionately impact. Uh, next slide, please. Another key provision within the Environmental Justice Act Kind of telling us how we go about this. Again, we're about to get to the mechanics, but we, before we sort of dive into it, this, I um, wanted to share this provision as well, uh, because the act really calls on um, us to be uh, ambitious and innovative, looking for new ways to pull together information from communities, um, thinking, considering multiple languages and multiple formats and transparently sharing information and not just general information or information about a meeting, but information about adverse environmental effects from its proposed state action. I would just pause to see if anybody has, we'll, we'll keep going through it, but if anyone has comments or thoughts before we keep we start diving into the details. Happy to keep going. So there's um, uh, six components of the best practices of community engagement as defined in the Environmental Justice Act. Um, one is looking at time, when are the meetings convened? Um, one is looking at the notice, how are we getting the word out? How is the agency getting the word out about a, a public consultation or meeting? Um, outreach tools, so how are we describing what the state is doing? How are we receiving input from community members? Where are these meetings taking place and being convened? And then um, what, are the, what are the outreach materials look like and are they accessible? 
Next slide. So, and I guess I will just reiterate, I'll, I'll keep going through these slides, um, but if anybody has questions or comments, please feel to raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and jump in. Uh, I think I, I wanna make sure we kind of get to a chance to have a conversation, but if you have questions or, or thoughts as we're going, um, I'm happy to pause. So time, I think this is fairly straightforward, but I think one of the, the you know, the call from the um, Environmental Justice Act is that consultations need to be offered at different times of the day and different days of the week. So it could be during the work day, um, Monday through Friday, it could be in the evenings, and it could be on weekends. And so what we've started doing in light of this, so this, this act came into effect, was signed into law on the 1st of July of last year. So what we started to do for Air Quality Control Commission um, outreach sessions is to convene multiple sessions, sometimes addressing the same information or the same subject matter, but at different times in the hopes that we would be able to reach more community members um, by doing so. I would say, um, and I, I shared that the sort of table there is just a snapshot of these were four meetings that we convened last fall, the number of people um, who registered and then the number of people who, who joined, who participated in the meeting um, to share, to sort of, I would say the takeaway from, um, in terms of timing from those four meetings is kind of confusing, honestly. There was a Saturday meeting that was not very well attended. That's the November 6th Saturday meeting. Um, but then you can see that last Saturday meeting on um, the 4th of December had 92 people. And so, um, you know, I think there's, um, we're in the process of learning a lot and we're gonna continue to sort of follow these numbers and also, um, and, and we'll get more to this, you know, kind of when people are, would prefer meetings, that's something we've been asking community members as they're joining meetings and um, through surveys. So in addition to people actually showing up, we're also inviting people to express their and communicate their uh, preference, both in terms of uh, language as well as time. Next slide. Um, so this uh, best practice is also I would say one of the more straightforward ones, uh, community or uh, um, meeting notice. And so the requirement is that the notice is um, shared out publicly at least 30 days in advance. Uh, we've been able to meet that from almost all of our meetings. And, and really we're actually trying to schedule things even farther out. So at this point, with regard to air meetings, we're kind of looking at the next three months and trying to put things on, um, flag to community members far in advance when meetings are coming up so people can kind of plan accordingly. Um, and I would say, I, th I think this is working pretty well. One of the tools we are using on notice that I do think is also helping is that um, thanks to Joel and the whole environmental justice team, we've been able to launch uh, an environmental justice website as well as a new listserv and so that's been, um, I think, a valuable tool and we're hoping it will serve as a, a one-stop shop, not just for air meetings, but for um, uh, meetings convened within other environmental divisions as well, so that um, community members can, can go to one place and see what are the different opportunities that are coming up for engagement in the next month or two. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Joel. Next slide. Great, thanks. So the, the next, so we, we looked at the time of the meeting, we looked at how are we getting the, you know, the timing of the, of the notice and the 30 days. And then um, this next provision calls for, you know, how are we publicizing both the state action and, and meetings and suggests that we are using many different methods of outreach, a listing of a full, um, a, a range of ways we could be disseminating, disseminating information. I would say um, some of these things we are um, we have been doing. Just looking at that um, list, I would say one thing we tried last fall was social media, and so I, I shared some just snapshots of both English and Spanish um, Facebook and and Twitter outreach. 
uh, we work closely with local governments and we work closely with our local, uh, with our um, tribal liaison to work with sovereign tribal governments um, and some other um, different types of community organizations, whether, whether specific community based um, or, or religious based or issue specific based. I will say, I think there's a lot of space for us to do um, a lot more outreach. And some of this has been, um, I would say curtailed, but not totally halted by COVID. Because uh, ideally some of these uh, connecting with community members who aren't currently already connected with CDPAT or the Air Pollution Control Division um, is hard to do electronically. And so doing some of these things face-to-face -face would be great. And we haven't had that um, possibility for quite some time and that's been pretty curtailed. Um, I would say one thing that's, that's come up in a couple of meetings in terms of feedback we're getting in terms of you know, what are the channels of communicating information, whether it be about a meeting or about a state action. And um, radio and possibly Spanish speaking radio has some, is a recommendation that's come up a couple of times on conversations. And that was a recommendation from community members. So I think that's something we will also be exploring. And maybe maybe I'll just pause there and see if there, if there are any thoughts, because this is kind of a, a big one that we, right now, we've we've tested some of our current methods of outreach and we're trying to expand upon them. And the act is calling for actually quite a bit more um, diversity in terms of those methods that we haven't yet implemented. I guess I'm, hi, this is Dominique Gomez. Um, I am curious a little bit about the mixture between which of these are paid and not paid. So, you know, presumably radio and other advertising are paid, but then even like working with civic associations, like, you know, to the extent that other groups can be compensated for their outreach, even if it's not paid advertising. Uh, I'm just wondering if that has a bigger impact. I think that's a great question, Dominique. We've, I mean, in terms of like the social media, we've done both just organic and paid posts. Um, radio would be paid. And I think I, I saw a, a question from Ilo. So we haven't done that. Those are recommend, the, the radio recommendation has come in um, recently, um, but several times recently. So we haven't yet, but I would say it's towards the top of our list is something that we would um, like to work to implement and allocate resources for. We are, um, we have a, we are working to hire a communication specialist for the environmental justice unit right now. And so I think that's that's kind of an exciting opportunity that we want to pursue when we have a um, when we have a communication specialist who can help us implement that. Natalie, I, I might also weigh in with this this is um, kind of re reflective on on Ilda's second point that she just put in the chat. Um, you know, I, I think we have explored the option of, of PSAs, so so free um, free sort of announcements with, with media stations. And I think we're, we're fortunate, actually, Aaron is with us. Um, Aaron, I, I think you were talking with, I, I believe, maybe Sion about possibly doing a, a PSA back in the fall. And I, I wonder if you could kind of talk more about what that, that looked like. Sorry yeah, for absolutely. calling you out of the Oh, no, that's okay. So um, most... Um, agencies, news agencies, radio agencies are required to hit a certain quota of public service announcements. And so if you have funds, right, to, to pay for those advertisements, that's great, but it's also a very competitive market and it can be quite costly. So we have explored um, working with Univision Telemundo to um, put out some PSAs. Um, and that is something just again, you know, as Natalie had mentioned, it's, um, it's a it's a resource limitation to some degree, but certainly something that is um, higher priority right now. Thanks, Erin. So I think, I mean, and I think this is a space where I hope we have um, some opportunities to try out some other methods of outreach in the coming um, in the coming months, and we'd be able to report back to this subcommittee and to the Environmental Justice Action Task Force on 
um, what the what the impact or results or response to those other methods of outreach are. Um, Natalie, I, I noticed that um, Jonathan Asher is on now, and um, Jonathan, if you want to just take a second to inter introduce yourself, we did a round of introductions in the beginning. Sure, happy to. Nice to see everybody, and, and apologies to not super see me with a mask on, but uh, we're, we're back in the office here today. So uh, with the noise in the background, but I'm the Governor's Senior Policy Advisor for Natural Resources and Environment, um, and uh, just super thankful to be a part of this broader um, uh, task force um, and, uh, and, the, and the subcommittee here and just excited about it. So, um, and, and apologies, of course, got looped into a fire drill at the very beginning of this meeting. So <laughs> apologies for joining late, but we're, we're doing all the best we can. So um, nice to see everybody and meet everybody. And uh, hopefully we can uh, see each other maskless at some point, um, but uh, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the moment. Great, thank you and welcome Donovan. I think we, keep, we can keep going to the next slide then. Um, so, and then the, another one of the best practices is how do we, um, as, a, as a state agency, what are our methods for receiving public input? Um, and so as is listed here, the Environmental Justice Act is calling for in-person meetings, online meetings, and different comment portals, portals, email, call-in meetings. Um, and to date, a large part of what we've, a vast majority of what we've done are all virtual and, and online meetings, also with ongoing and regular public comment um, options and opportunities via email or through surveys. Uh, and I'll share a few examples of kind of what we've done um, so far in some of the meetings. Um, maybe next slide, please. So in some of these meetings, in part to create um, a space that feels a bit more like a dialogue and not a one-way kind of a formal public comment and then there's no actual response. Uh, at, at several meetings, kind of just to warm up and get a sense of who's in the room, we've asked um, some general questions like, you know, what is what do you perceive as the greatest threat to air quality in your community? So these are you know, word clouds we did through a, an online survey during some of the uh, enhanced outreach sessions that we convened um, last year. I wouldn't say this is necessarily scientific, but it gives us a chance to see what um, give people a space for, for voice. And, and also a sense a chance for us to understand, you know, what they're, why they're showing up for these meetings and what they're concerned about. Next slide. Uh, this is another example of in, in meeting surveys that we've asked. So the last one was sort of about, you know, what, what brings them here as concern in terms of concerns around air quality. And this is, um, these are polls around, you know, have you, have you joined in these meetings before? And so, you can see it was for one of the meetings, it was a bit more split and about 60% had joined and 40% had not. Um, whereas uh, one of the other ones was more of a three quarters had, or had joined previously, which sort of tends to be the number that has come up, come up more recently and uh, more consistently about one quarter of the people who are joining are um, uh, identifying themselves as someone who hasn't participated in an Air Quality Control Commission or CEPHE meeting previously. Next slide. So again, we're sort of thinking about how do we collect input. So we've sort of done those in those um, in meeting surveys. Uh, we've also done surveys after meetings to ask people, you know, sort of how it went and and where they're from and if they have. You know, some of these get back to the mechanics of community engagement. So we're asking them, you know, were the things that made it easy to join, things that made it hard to join, um, what can we do to make it easier? Um, I'll just note here in the sort of bottom right corner in terms of how can we make participation easier for one of the meetings. Um, many people suggested better advertising and getting the word out. Um, next slide. Uh, and then we also, you know, we asked about language, we asked about time, again, to sort of track some of the feedback and get a sense of are there trends of when people would prefer to have meetings. 
um, and, um, and interpretation available. And then kind of this bottom uh, line here, the sort of what else is just a, an open-ended anything else you want to share or that would be helpful for us to strengthen our practices and strengthen the community engagement next time. And I'm, I'm just sharing these as kind of snapshots as different ways and different tools we've started to use to gather more information, um, gather community input. A, a lot of it is focused on the process in part because I think that it, how we engage is a huge part of um, getting to that meaningful engagement and um, capturing community input. So, um, and then the other piece and um, what uh, uh, the Environmental Justice Act calls for uh, speaks to location. And so this is again, presents challenges with COVID, but um, was, was really calling for us to be uh, convening meetings in diverse locations, um, going to areas and communities where there are concerns or issues or where impact um, of the public policy is going to impact that area and meeting in those neighborhoods. Um, again, that has been uh, less possible than we would have liked because of COVID. Um, but one thing we are starting to do this spring and hope to make uh, more of a regular practice is to convene some Spanish only sessions. Um, we did do this in a consultation for the Colorado Enviro screen tool last summer. We had several public meetings, uh, one of which was a Spanish language one in an effort to make that space that much more, hope ideally or in, in theory that much more inviting and comfortable for Spanish speaking public community members who wanted to join. Maybe I'll just pause there for a second, both on the location and how we're pulling together um, and how we're capturing community input. See if there are any questions or comments. This is Marsha. Um, I, I wasn't sure when we could comment on things. I didn't realize we were doing it at times. I was just, I may have comments that go back in the beginning of the presentation, but um, in terms of location, I, I, I like here that there's a practice to be in the actual community with um, those residents. But I also think you have to take into consideration the location of that location. So parking is a big deal right? Is it accessible mm -hmm. to all of the people in that community? Um, uh, you want to make sure safety, I think, is a part of that. Um, so for to me, it's parking is a huge issue, why people may not come to events, and then also the safety element to it. Is there access to public transportation for those who do not have vehicles to get to this location as well? Um, and then also for those who um, you know, if they're not able to get public transit or whatnot, like, do we offer programs where, you know, maybe there's a Lyft program that we've partnered with Lyft that they can ride to this facility or something like that. So I think the access to this opportunity is really important. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marsha. And I'm seeing some other rec... Bilda, I don't know if you want to share some of your input in the, uh, via the chat or... I think everybody can see it as well. Yeah, no, I just 100% agree with March. I think access to public, I was, she was like getting out of her mouth as I was like finishing typing it, but <laughs> access to public transit, bus passes to individuals, like that will be fantastic, especially as your, you know, Department of Public Health and Environment, making sure also being able to create multimodal ways for individuals to, to get to those locations, or if they're even easy and accessible trans, um, multimodal ways like bike, bike path, et cetera, to be able to access those locations. It's, it's, it's really important. Great, thank you. Um, I, I will just add on the bus passes and, and providing that to individuals participating in the meeting, I think it's a great idea. Right now in our current um, predominantly uh, virtual mode, we are able to offer participation incentives for community members who are joining um, community sessions outside of a paid capacity. And so those have been um, $45 gift cards 
for 90 minute sessions and we've issued, um, I can look at the numbers, but we probably issued a few dozen of those in the last few months in response to requests and, and community <clears throat> engagement. I see there are two hands raised. I think Mara was up first. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of really great things in here and I'm, I'm excited that as a state agency, CDPH is really leading a lot of these conversations. So kudos. I did want to bring up um, another factor always is childcare and access to childcare, whether that's at the meeting or at a community center to partner nearby, if that's been a consideration at all. Absolutely, in terms of childcare, um, and that's something that is, um, it, it is in some of the provisions and is not something that we have or I should say, um, let's see, in the Air Toxics Act, there was a requirement that childcare was provided, um, but since we're convening a meeting virtually, we'll be, we'll be offering participation incentives. So it wouldn't be in-person childcare, but it would be, um, it would defer the cost if that person was- um, Okay, so you could use those incentives for other I, I think we're true. trying to think of, I mean, the point is how do you, how do you take away any kind of financial burden or barrier yeah. to that engagement? And so, and so, I mean, and if there are things that we, that either the Environmental Justice Act missed or, or we haven't tried out either because of COVID or because it's not um, been part of our practices, like this would be a place to think about this. So this is really helpful. Um, I see um, Ilda and uh, Marsha both have their hands up. Yeah, and mine was actually piggybacking on that piece. I think the, the, the $45 incentive is great, uh, but a lot of times that ends up paying for childcare for individuals. So I think pushing in those spaces, like if we're gonna have them in person, definitely ensuring that we can have either bus passes and sort of like transit multimodality options, uh, because ultimately those $45 can pay maybe for maybe a four an hour childcare depending on you know, the services, then it's also depending how many kids you have. Um, so yeah, that was just primarily one I wanted to elevate. Oh, also, sorry, my other point. Uh, one of the pieces, especially as we're meeting in person, being able to make people feel more at ease, especially coming to these meetings. I don't know if we have seen uh, rapid tests being available in public meetings if, if those open up again. Uh, in-person meetings uh, because a lot of folks will not feel comfortable showing up, um, you know, in person. And if we do them in person, that there should be easy access for people to be able to participate online. Uh, because if you know, people might, you know, if having COVID also should not be an impediment for you to be able to be in those meetings. Uh, so that's just another aspect to be able to elevate that at times. And for example, we're working with that with the Health Equity Commission is that. Even when we do it online for our own team, it's just really hard for folks remotely. They're not, they're not hearing the conversations well. Sometimes, you know, the central mics are not as great or even the camera is pointing at, you know, at, at, it's not actually pointing at the speaker, it might be pointing just at a PowerPoint. So just, just a couple of thoughts. Thank you so much, Hilda. And I'll just say, I, th I do think there's, we've already had some um, conversations with the IT department um, with CDOT about how to convene successful um, hybrid meetings and the technology and the, you know, all these things have additional procedures and um, we wouldn't want those, you know, not knowing those procedures or handling them well, we wouldn't want that to get in the way of um, meaningful communication and engagement. So I think, um, honestly, we were hoping to be able to convene some hybrid session in March and just decided that those were going to be just virtual. So it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a dynamic space that we're all watching, but I, um, I hear you on that need and and figuring that out and not just having it a bad central microphone and that being okay, like it needs to be set up so that everyone has equal, can equally hear and engage. And um, that's something we're watching that space. Um, Marsha, I think you had a hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me lower my hand before I forget. Um, what I was gonna say is, you know, I think on one of the slides that you had you know, you mentioned the, I think it was the form of communication. Um, and so, you know, religious organizations was on there and, I, and I'm speaking this from personal experience. When we talk about the location and the different relationships we have, um, you know, many times religious organizations have transportation, they have buses, 
schools have buses. And so if we develop strategic relationships with these organizations, we can leverage what they offer as a service to be able to bring in community members if there's transportation issues. If we're willing to pay for certain services, that's another way where we can use our funding in a more creative way that actually supports that community. So when we think of transportation, I would say consider some of the organizations that are based there because they may actually have their own form and we can provide their services. So that's also supporting that community economically as well. Um, my role, I play a lot in terms of supporting small business. So I'm always thinking of ways, how can we support our small local businesses? And that could be a pretty good effective way. Um, something else I wanted to throw in and I might be jumping the gun. You know, I'm, I'm hearing that we have a Spanish translation which I think is great and we need that, but we certainly have other languages throughout our state that we need to be able to offer. And I don't know, um, that's one of the things I'm looking at is ensuring that based on the community we're in, we are providing those proper languages and the services um, of that community. Absolutely, and that was a great, I'm, I'm glad you caught that. And, and I, well, first I wanna say thank you for the creative ideas around transportation and how those resources through some of those community organizations could be employed. I think that's a terrific idea and I can't wait to have challenges around transport be part of my job, not just <laughs> Zoom challenges. Um, and then in terms of languages, um, thank you, yes. So the, the Environmental Justice Act is looking for um, translation to whatever, whatever language is the language spoken in any community. Um, and Spanish is the one that we are most focused on um, right now, initially, because it is um, the most widely spoken and in many of the community members that, communities that we're working with. Um, but there are many other languages and, and large communities and uh, speaking other languages. And I think there are other um, examples within CDPHE of how that's how um, uh, there have been translation and interpretation into Somali and other languages that has been really essential to have those community conversations. So we we do have so um, Rosario Rusi is uh, our in language and interpretation specialist, and she's does our trans does translations and interpretation in Spanish. But we also work with um, the community language cooperative to do any kind of translation or interpretation in any language. And so it's not limited by, to Spanish um, at all. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, and I'm not sure that I will perfectly articulate this because it's just kind of, um, uh, you know, random thought bubbles that are popping into my head as we're talking about all this stuff. But, um, you know, I think particularly lesson from the pandemic, right, is, um, you know, pre-pandemic times, there were kind of, you know, in-person meetings, and now we've all done virtual. There's also maybe something that I think it would be great for us to kind of think about um, is, you know, are there opportunities or resources or things that the state should be looking at from kind of a hybrid option perspective as well? And so does that mean, you know, we should be considering investing in, you know, some level of mobile technology that when there is like an AQCC hearing or something like that, that we could then take to a community center or a place where people, you know, if they don't have internet access or something like that could still participate in those kinds of hearings. It seems like there's a lot of potential opportunities there and I'm not thinking through all of them in real time, but it, you know, in addition to kind of the physical meeting space and how do we make that more accessible and then the virtual meeting space and how do we make that more accessible, maybe we should also kind of consider the hybrid world a little bit too and, and kind of um, evaluate opportunities there. Thanks, Jonathan. And I, I appreciate that flag, particularly for the resources. We have, we've certainly started investigating what some of that technology looks like. That was the sort of call I mentioned that we had with CDOT and their team because they've got um, they've got a particular setup, but I but particularly that mobile piece I think is something that to start thinking about because um, while COVID has created a, the limitations on our movement, it, it's also made a lot of meetings that otherwise had um, historically only been convened in person, put them online means that community members from across the state who 
otherwise would have had to travel to, to the PHE campus, for example, have been able to convene and join meetings um, uh, more regularly and more conveniently than, than previously. Um, um, Ilda. Yeah, and I wanted to elevate definitely, I think language competencies, transportation, compensation for individuals, but also I think as we're looking and tapping into different networks that are already established uh, within these spaces, I think an opportunity that it's sometimes missed is being able to reach out to all the different commissions and advisory boards that are already established of those individuals that are heavily active and have large connections within the community to share these meetings and to share some of those resources uh, along the way that can sort of spread the work faster. Uh, and being able to get those key individuals that really are, are spokespeople in, within their communities and um, are widely connected. So being able, like, for example, I'm definitely gonna be connecting the Health Equity Commission individuals that have different connections within the community, but being able to do that all across the different boards and commissions will be really, really important. Thank you. Thank you for that prompt, and Thank you for thinking about how you might be able to share some of this information with some of the other um, boards and commissions that you sit on. That, that's uh, terrific. I think I don't see any more hands. I think we can go, we can keep going. Um, yeah, on to outreach. So then the um, final best practice that's articulated in the um, Environmental Justice Act is about the actual outreach materials. And it calls for these materials that are, are speaking about and explaining state action to be in accessible layperson, simple language terms, translated into the top two languages spoken in a community, so not necessarily um, Spanish, um, and that the materials inform um, communities of these opportunities that can, where they can provide input either on the state action or their rights, the possible outcomes of that action, and you know, what are the future public um, input processes. So I would say the outreach materials has been, um, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to continue to strengthen how we, how we do this. Um, and really I'm looking forward to thinking about how we continue to build our capacity in response to community recommendations and calls and also in response to the requirements of the Environmental Justice Act. I, I would say one of the challenges um, in creating uh, outreach materials that, that kind of tick all of these boxes is um, just the challenge in converting something from the Air Pollution Control Division that might be a very technical document into an accessible, actionable, meaningful one pager for a community member. And um, I think, I don't think anyone here would be surprised to hear that, that that's actually not just a quick thing to, um, to convert. It's a, it's a process and it's, um, if you really want it to be effective and, and meaningful, it takes quite a lot of time. And that's something that we don't have a lot of, um, I think as we build our communication teams, it will be really helpful to consider how this language can be adjusted to be more accessible to more community members who do care about their air or their water or waste issues and want to learn more um, and not have to um, uh, dive into fairly impenetrable fact sheets or um, technical jargon in order to understand how a rulemaking or how a, a decision may impact their life in their community. Um, so any, if there are any um, sort of thoughts or input on the outreach materials, we'd really welcome that. The, yeah, the next slide that um, Lupna shared is just a, another snapshot of kind of some of the initial matrix of what we're, what we're tracking. Um, I think this is um, an initial um, place that we're starting, but we, I think there are many other pieces we'd like to be learning from and, um, and tracking so we can keep strengthening our, our um, community outreach and engagement.
any other thoughts or input on the on the outreach materials themselves. I think some of the re recommendations or requests that we're hearing from folks is, you know, looking and in interest in more um, visual documents or um, videos or, or things that are less text dense and more inviting to pick up and learn from as opposed to something that looks pretty cumbersome and um, hard to navigate or hard to dissect. Hey, Natalie, um, I have a comment here in terms of material. Um, I want to say this is, I don't want to be rude and say this, but like the material that we produce, you know, oftentimes as professionals, we, we can, and as experts, research, et cetera, we, we can be very technical. And we have to remember that the audience that's reading it is not. And so it's not only finding a person or a company that can translate the language, but it's, it's translating in a way that people can understand, the regular people can understand who don't have that research knowledge. I think that's like one of the biggest things when I think of the material. Um, something that is more visual versus reading material is gonna be helpful for people as well. Um, and I'm sure your comms people can in, um, can manage all these things, but remembering the different generations. So I, I, apparently I've gotten to the age now where I need to, the text on documents needs to be a little bit larger. My eyes are a little <laughs> more mature. So making sure that we're conscious of all these things, right? It can't be too small because we want to get all the information on the document as much as possible, but make it in, in a reader easy, easy document for people to understand and read. I think it's a big one. Absolutely. Thank you, Marsha. And yes, you know, the infographics are something we've been talking about, but visual ways to tell complicated things in a way that isn't um, that isn't text dense. Um, and and I, Marsha, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think trend, it's not just a question of translating into different languages. If it's super technical and it's six different languages, it doesn't make it any more accessible. Um, and I think that, um, you know, getting it to more accessible language. And it's also one of the things we've tried to do is, and I've been working with some of the technical um, staff and experts within the Air Pollution Control Division is, you know, can we, literally the fact should, should say, you know, why do I care? What, how is this gonna, how is this rulemaking gonna impact my family? Because what I care about is my family and my health and getting to walk my dog. And so why do I care about an oil and gas rulemaking? And so trying to make that connection and step it back a bit in a way that, um, and I, th I think a lot of folks in Colorado can think about examples of how air quality has impacted their, their day to day because we've all, um, that's, that's been a more common experience. Ilda. Yeah, I was definitely gonna elevate that, Natalie. I think being able to say, what is at stake for individuals? I think when we wanna engage new individuals that have not been a part of these processes, like a super heavy test text fact sheet, it's not going to be readable or like people capturing people's attention. We know that now in videos, people's attention span between 30 and 45 seconds at most. Um, so being able to keep people's attention span into, you know, something that they want to grab onto or like why it's going to pique my interest is so important to be able to make it in a quick, concise way. And you're living for people in disproportionately impacted communities. What is at stake for them? And even when we're looking at rural communities, a lot of the times it tends to be very uh, in urban centers on the Denver metro area that I think they're explained to, especially being able to specify why would it be important for individuals in rural sites too. Thank you so much, that's super helpful. And again, this is our this is our first meeting and kind of beginning of input. So this is um, the door is not closing on on these conversations. I really appreciate um, everyone's feedback and insights and, and experiences here. And um, I mean, this is sort of setting the stage for what will be ongoing several months of of conversation and and work for the subcommittee and consideration for the Environmental Justice Action Task Force. Um, and so I think we're sort of shifting. So that was, those were the six um, best practices that we went through. Um, I'm happy, I think I saw a note, I'm happy to, we can certainly make these slides available um, if that's helpful. 
just a snapshot of some of the meetings. This is kind of an FYI, and this is just specific for air, um, the meetings coming up in the next um, in the next three months. And there are quite a few, which will um, keep me and, and many others very busy, but also it's an opportunity for us to uh, take some of the feedback we're hearing from you and from community members and, and apply it, I would say, with every meeting that we're convening, where we are um, convening debriefs and considering what will we do differently, what did we learn, um, what feedback did we hear, and what can we do to um, take action on that feedback. Um, so this is just a snapshot to say many, many, many meetings in the um, in the coming months, some of these haven't been announced, but we'll, many of them will be announced in the next um, week or two. Um, next slide. And then maybe um, I would love just to pause on this page a little bit and just kind of get our wheels turning and, and maybe start a bit of a conversation. I am watching our time. We've got about 45 more minutes, so I think that's enough um, time for what's left on our agenda. But in part because a lot of the, the best practices that are um, so essential and that are articulated in the environmental justice sector are, are fairly mechanical. Um, and I think a lot of what we hear and what we've heard um, from many different community members in the enhanced outreach sessions last, um, last fall and some recent sessions this year is, you know, how Community members are looking for change, they're looking for a reflection of their input that they've received and they want they want to see um, the agency doing something different or taking on a recommendation or reducing harm in their communities. Or ultimately, that is the goal of the Environmental Justice Act and the work that we're doing is to reduce those harms and, and strengthen protections. And so I, I wanted to just take um, a little bit of a step back and think about um, I invite your thoughts, I think, on, on, the, on, on how to ensure some of these uh, mechanical pieces translate to something that's meaningful and bringing about the kind of change and reduction of harm and response to community voice that is so clearly called for by the Environmental Justice Act. Marsha. Thank you. I'm trying to be, I don't want to be rude, so I'm raising my hand, sorry. Um, so I, I don't know if this answers your question here, but um, a couple things popped up for me after seeing the presentation. One, I definitely want to be able to hear from our community members that are on the call um, in their perspective, right? Because they're on the other end of seeing what we're actually presenting to the community. Um, but, but something that sticks with me is, you know, there is, you can have like fatigue from the community. Right, like I know, you know, that the CDPHE, you have your community engagement and outreach efforts, but CDOT has their community engagement and outreach efforts. And all these other agencies in the state have all their outreach efforts. So we're all hitting the same communities and there, there is a fatigue that can come from that community. And, and we should not put that on them, absolutely not. And so I feel one of our responsibilities as the state is, really looking at how for all of our agencies, when we put together and we think of engagement and working with the community, we have to do it in a way that does not tire out the community and truly builds relationships. And I wanna say great job on this presentation, great job on all the work you know your agency has done. This is fantastic work. You have data, you have information, but the one thing that I, I'm not sure I saw or something that we haven't discussed yet is actual engagement. We've done the outreach, but we're not engaging. Engaging is building the relationships, having long-term relationships and impact with these communities. And I think there, there should be a focus on that as well. How do we continue? Because you don't wanna, you know, here's a project or here's a study that we're doing. We, we, hit, we hit the community one time, five times and then we never engage with them again. That is not the way that we should be doing outreach and engagement. And so how do we make that more uniform so that it benefits all the agencies, but really more so the community and we can really help them long-term. That's one of the things that I, I wanted to mention and bring up in this conversation. I think I'm having a brain fart now, so 
let me think about other parts of the question and I'll let everyone else go. Wonderful, thank you, Marsha. Ilda. Yeah, as much, I cannot agree anymore with you. I think burnout is real. And I think we are sometimes tapping on the same individuals that are super activists in our community and not expanding also that, that network of individuals. And it is so true what you're saying. A lot of the times we're looking at outreach, not engagement. And outreach is a one-way direction on, on information rather than, as you were mentioning, that conversation and the true relationship that needs to happen to create transformation in our communities. But we know this transformation work takes time and we're gonna see definitely some benchmarks met within the livelihood of this task force. Uh, but how are we actually constantly talking to community members and reporting out of what is happening? What are we accomplishing? Because I think in many instances also, we get a lot of feedback, but we don't say what we did with that feedback and what is being implemented and what are things that are in transition that might take longer than a couple of weeks or longer than a month between meetings to get fully done. So I think being able to have a mechanism in which we're constantly communicating back to community of what we're doing, what their, all their input, how their input is being put at work, because it can be very disengaging and dismantling to see that you are doing all this work, you're stepping outside of your, you know, out, outside of office hours, outside of things like utilizing your, your hours that you might have doing to the few hours that you might have with your family and kids to utilize it on these procedures and not being able to see any results. Um, and I will say, I think a constant feedback, group, uh, feedback loop, loop of being able to engage community, community in focus groups and really ask, how are we doing? Because I think in so many instances, we're talking at community and we're having, we might have a specific um, hearing on air quality or oil and gas, whatever it is. But there's not actually a feedback loop of like what is needed outside of just this specific uh, subject or this specific rulemaking. Um, because I think when we have that open conversation of community rather than us telling the community what we want to do, them telling us what are the solutions, that's when we come out with the best outcomes for, for community overall. Thank you, uh, Marsha and Ilda, for the, that input and, and recommendations, and and absolutely sort of starting with the the fatigue and community burnout. I think that was something um, taking that into account and understanding how many requests of community members' time, particularly as leaders emerge in, on particular issues or particular areas, those people are often getting those individuals or people from a particular community are getting many, many, fielding many, many requests. And so when we started um, implementing the Environmental Justice Act and, and um, wanted to follow this requirement that a meeting needs to be convened or a particular issue needs to have a, a conversation during the daytime, during the evening and on the weekend, we were concerned that was gonna contribute to community fatigue and, and burnout. And so I think that's a space that we're we're, we're watching. Um, and then also on, on the engagement, not being outreach, that sort of outreach is a one way, here's some information and engagement is a two way. It is something that we've, we've been communicating and trying to create space for in all of these sessions. We had two sessions this last week on ozone that, um, that are more of a dialogue. And, and it, is a, it is a process and it's a relationship trust building process. So it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think one of the um, measures that Air Pollution Control Division and with the Air, Air, um, AQCC, the Air Quality Control Commission, is just as we've been um, creating space so there is more of a dialogue and there's a direct response and there it could be a procedural response or a technical response or a general response, but uh, questions are being answered as opposed to kind of going out into the void and then it goes on to the next public comment, I think a lot of community members who've engaged in some of the air rulemakings are used to the more formal, each community member gets um, three minute public comment, there's no response, there's no conversation. And you know these community members are sharing, um, they could be sharing very specific, very personal lived experiences, and then there's not no response, which it, I, don't, I don't think feels good for anyone in the room. And so we're trying to shift that um, in these enhanced outreach sessions or community sessions, whatever we want to call them, but um, just in terms of any kind of 
opportunity to engage with community, creating a space where it's a back and forth and the goal really is to answer questions. And, and um, it's not just questions, but also look, community members are looking for action. And so that's kind of one of the one of the questions up on this slide is, you know, is there a like a metric of responsiveness or what how how can we track this in a way that holds the agency accountable and can dem demonstrate what change there might be so it doesn't feel like a one-way street, but this is a, a process and um, and change is where 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 can change be illustrated and demonstrated? So I, I didn't expect us to have necessarily answers to these big questions that I struggle with, but I, I think it would be great, you know, in the, with the work of this subcommittee and, and working with the Environmental Justice Action Task Force to think about, you know, our possible responses and how do we um, ensure that the, that the work I'm doing is working towards meaningful engagement, not just Taking the boxes and counting the number of the amount of outreach that we're that I'm conducting, but also thinking about how you know going forward, how do we want to continue? This isn't going to be just because the report's done in November doesn't mean the job is done. So we want to continue to measure that responsiveness and measure that ongoing continued um, change towards engagement and response to community and reduction of harm and and, and strengthening of environmental justice. In terms of the metric of responsiveness, one of the things that we've been talking about in one of um, our processes where we hope to do more engagement is how are we going to know like what we've changed, like what what actually you know it's not just that we went out and we held these events and you know we listened. What what did we actually what changed that we would not have done, and how are we going to be able to quantify that internally to ourselves and. You know, it's hard in advance because it's not a magic number. It's not like, oh, five things changed, right? It's not a number. It, it, it's an, it often might be an approach. It might be hard to quantify in some things. But I think that that's the thing that we're asking is like, if we had not done, you know, it's kind of the, if we had not done this, what would we not know? What did we learn, you know, that's changing our approach? And so um, it, it's hard. It's not a good metric for, you know, a, a wig or something that's like easily quantifiable, but I do think it is something that you can hold yourselves to. No, that's great. Thanks, Dominique. I think I've been thinking about, you know, like, I, like I mentioned here, you know, what are things we can take action on like radio ads or allocation of resource, like Jonathan's suggestion, allocation of resources for, um, you know, technology to convene hybrid meetings. So if we're on the road, but not everyone can join, how do we make sure everyone can engage meaningfully? I and mean, I think those are the, some of that's what's going to facilitate further engagement. Again, that's not the reduction of harm, but it's a, it's a creation of space for more meaningful community engagement. So there's just kind of two different, there, there are many different pieces to this, um, to this challenge we're working towards. Hilda. Yeah, and I think something important is just asking the community what is the best way that they receive their information. Uh, we know that depending on social media, we will see like elderly Latino women, probably it's going to be Facebook in some in different ways. But if we're looking at like young demographics, Facebook is kind of that. Like, what, what other ways are we utilizing to reach out to individuals? Uh, but also being able to ask about what other mechanisms? Is it having a monthly press release in which we're informing where the movement has been happening? Things that people in the community can feel like they're constant, that they can loop it, like join in and be able to hear updates. Is it through, like, are we gonna have a 20, 30 page report? Or is it gonna be requested by community? Like actually we want some infographics and something that they wonkifies this process and talks about it in regular terms and comparisons of how does this affect directly my community? Um, I think the definitely having the response with the way that we do the response is so important. Thanks so much, Yelda. And I think to, to your earlier point too, like how to ask those questions um, and ask people what they need or what in terms of engagement or information outside of a particular rulemaking. I think that's something we're 
we're trying some of those in pre, post and, and during surveys are, are starting to get to that, but that's only for the people who are already showing up for a conversation about a rulemaking or a, um, a particular process. So I think exploring how to, how to invite that input would be really helpful. we can go to the next slide now if there are further comments or Ilda, do you have another is your hand raised great <laughs> forgot to um, lower it no worries perfect. so then so so here we are as a subcommittee for the best practices for community engagement um, and i think these are um just some questions about how this subcommittee wants to work going forward and then on the next slide we have kind of a proposed calendar of how, what our work might look like from month to month. But I think before looking at that calendar, just wondered, you know, where to, um, how does this subcommittee want to possibly invite or gather public input either from written comments or from public engagement during these subcommittee meetings or um, possibly inviting community members to come and join future sessions to speak about, um, either generally about community engagement or particular or specific recommendations or experiences. Um, we do not have interpretation for this session. Um, so wondering if that's something that people feel like would be valuable and something for us to consider. And then um, also asking for all of you um, subcommittee members, but also for the benefit of, of um, possible public participants, um, do we want to consider different times of the day or evening or, or weekend going forward? And so those are, um, and I think there are probably other questions you might also want to think about for your work going forward, but I guess let's just maybe start with those or any that maybe aren't questions that aren't there, but you'd like to consider to think about how this com committee would like to proceed um, with its work. All right. Um, I will say that written and public comment are great, uh, but that is, you know, limiting to the time of the day that they're able to join in. Um, so I think being able to do either a constant listening campaign or being able to actually have focus groups in which we are inviting individuals to be able to provide that feedback outside of the specific meeting times will be really important. Um, and different focus groups from different demographics, like you organize a specific focus group, you're probably going to get, depending on like the organizing or the entities that are sharing them, you're going to get a very different demographic between times, between communities, whatever it is. So I think being able to have that open. But also there are many, many organizations that are doing an amazing work in multiracial engagement and multiracial organizing and community involvement that we might work in some of those spaces, but there's so many other experts. And uh, being able to, I don't know if it's like guest speakers or individuals that um, the, you know, task force members can invite into this space will be ideal. Um, even being able to ask for recommendations for our task force at large. Um, also, we have some uh, boards and commissions that do an incredible work in outreach. I wouldn't say not every, everyone is fantastic, but I think they have best practices or some hurdles that they have been able to tackle at this moment. Um, I will say for a community outreach subcommittee, interpretation should be a huge priority, especially if we're doing it in, in, at any time, honestly. I think prior, like translation should be super important and looking at the top spoken languages in the state of Colorado, if you know, as these ones are open for the whole state, they're not specifically regionally. Um, and as we're looking at timing, I think evenings or weekends are the most available for people. Um, and evenings kind of steering towards like after 5 p.m. or between 4 and 6, 7, I think those are better times for individuals to be able to actually participate if we're wanting the feedback from community members. I'll step back now. Thank you so I would much just, for your input. I'd love to echo what Ilda had um, talked about, especially with the focus groups. I think that that's really important uh, to be able to ask specific questions and specific feedback as we get closer to um, you know, finding what, what our best practices are going to be. Um, 
I think also attending, whether it's a few members of our subcommittee or others, of attending those uh, community meetings um, of those groups that, that are already doing best practices to observe, so that way we can uh, bring some best practices back to this group, I think would also be an important aspect. Um, when we talk about interpretation, I also think that we need to talk about sign language. Um, you know, virtually it's really can be very challenging for um, um, our deaf community to participate in. And um, I think that that's another language that we need to make sure is considered as we look at, um, at, at outreach and communication as well. I think timing of the day is incredibly important in terms of, of public comment outreach, especially evening weekend. I, I completely agree that, that we've got to make those available. I think from a um, pure subcommittee working standpoint, um, it is um, challenging um, to to not have this always uh, to to have only weekend and evenings and not from during the workday as well. And so I think we've got to figure out what that balance looks like. Thank you, Ilda and Mara. Any other thoughts on some of these questions or other questions that aren't, aren't posed on the slide? Natalie, maybe I can piggyback on, on what both Ilda and Mara said and just sort of pose the more specific question. You know, we don't have a ton of these meetings. So I think specific feedback about any specific um, people you'd like us to invite to future meetings would be really helpful to hear, not today, soon, um, so that we can get them invited to an upcoming meeting. So if there are, if there's any sort of community groups who you think are doing an especially great job with outreach that you mentioned, Yilda, or boards and commissions that you think would maybe have a, a chair or someone who can talk about what they do, definitely welcome those specific suggestions so that we can kind of launch that that process and maybe even have them at our, our next meeting. So just wanted to see if there are any ideas there. And it looks like Ian has a question. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Natalie can call in where I can, but go, go ahead, Ian. Hi, everyone. Ian Safoya, also from the task force. Not appointed to this subcommittee, but I definitely just wanted to tune in today and say hello. Um, you know, I... I think that one place in which I was hoping to bring connections is from the National Environmental Justice for All Act, which has done considerable outreach to a whole host of communities for several years. And they have a lot of really good practices when it comes to community engagement. Just as an example, I think other states um, like New Jersey, Washington have also made a lot of progress on this. And so I think we should be thinking to other national examples in addition to people who are doing the work within the state of Colorado. And um, one group that I've been engaging with for a while has been talking about language access, um, in particular related to COVID and, and the fires that took place in the mountains and how local communities, um, in particular local governments were really incapable um, in a timely manner of translating anything. And so talking to them, maybe a county from the mountains um, who struggled about what were the barriers they faced could be really powerful. And then on the other side of it, there's places doing it really well, like Aurora Water, Aurora Public Schools, Denver Public Schools. And I think talking with them could be good too because of the diversity of languages that are spoken there. Thanks so much for those recommendations, Ian, and thanks for joining us today. Marsha. Well, I um, I keep thinking back. I think it was the very first slide that you showed in the presentation. There was a comment. There was a. I think it, one of the values was build trust and transpa transparency. And I, I I understand this to be maybe CDPHEs, but I think like what is our goal for this subcommittee? I think I would add um, consistency is important because again that to me ties back to how we have so many agencies and all of us are are doing outreach and engagement um we need to make sure we're consistent in our message consistent in our effort and meaningful um to build that trust and transparency 
That's a great point, Marsha. And that, that trust and transparency language is from the Environmental Justice Act. So not just the PDPHE leading it necessarily, but that's the call coming from, from the act. But I think that consistency is a huge piece and inconsistency, I feel like can often erode trust. So. Lupna and Joel, are there other, does this, do we have enough guidance from the subcommittee for now in terms of how to convene next meetings or are there, are there sort of more specific questions we should drill down into and welcome your guidance? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is a great start. Um, just from the notes that Joel and I have been taking, it sounds like for the next subcommittee meeting and we can just do this by some like head nods or, you know, whatever, um, whatever way you guys want to indicate but um it sounds like yes we want to in terms of like public comment we do want to keep these meetings open to or kind of get get the message out as much as possible when these meetings are being held so people can attend and if they can't attend then they provide public comment um and in terms of interpretation um for the next meetings um there does seem to be a big emphasis on providing at least Spanish interpretation, and we can explore other options um, in the future for, for other languages as well. Um, maybe we could put on the closed captioning for, um, uh, for our deaf community. Um, and in terms of timing of meetings, uh, it sounded like we were gonna try to shoot for evenings or weekends between like the four and seven o'clock uh, timeframe. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that all of those things are kind of, well and good for the people that are in this task force or in this subcommittee um, to see if you know that is the those are kind of a, the guidelines that will take into scheduling the next meeting and um, adding some of the logistics. Um, and yeah, I mean, we will have to find some other avenues in terms of like the focus groups and the more like consistent um, contact. Um, I think we'll need to kind of create some structures for that to happen. Um, and so we will talk as an EJ unit and with each of you as a task force, um, we, can, we can continue that conversation here in terms of like exactly what we want it to look like for the next meeting or outside of these meetings. Um, but those are kind of some of the general takeaways that I, that I had from this conversation over the past few minutes. Um, any other thoughts, suggestions, add-ons? Okay, Isa, I saw your comment um, that on if we do weekends, we should try morning, um, morning and evening um, to see kind of the variety of people that that might come through. So maybe we want to um, just recognize we've got about twenty minutes left. If that, if we sort of have some guidance and. Um, in terms of going forward, maybe we can take a look at the initial kind of proposal and breakdown for work for this subcommittee. And so um, working with Lubna on, on kind of how this might roll out. And again, this is, this is a starting place to give um, the subcommittee a, a, a something to respond to, but this is not um, by any means a mandate or set in stone. But thinking about how to break this work apart. And I think the, the, the goal would be for the subcommittee to be able to draft um, recommendations by June. And so it seems like some of this work um, and having monthly meetings could be really helpful to facilitate that and prepare the subcommittee to, um, to be able to, to do that by June um, would be helpful. So kind of breaking it down, um, we thought that uh, if we had monthly meetings starting um, in February uh, after this meeting, we could sort of take stock of what we went over in this meeting and invite some community members perhaps to share some input or best practices. And we had some ideas of who, 
I think Ida is going to share a list, and and Ian has some other um, ideas of uh, community leaders and organizations doing great work outside of Colorado. Then, and they might have some examples that we could draw from. And and then for the next months, we we sort of tried to break down looking at particular best practices. If that might be a way of looking at the um, sort of first looking at the timing of meetings, notice and outreach tools, and um, and then looking at the other, the sort of the first three and then the second three in April, and which each of those meetings, uh, I could help and share input from whatever meetings we had just had, so that there's kind of an ongoing learning and sharing uh, with this committee in terms of, you know, what seems to be working, what feedback we're getting from community members, and how might that be reflected or um, in, in recommendations coming from subcommittee. So I think there's sort of two questions. One is if, if the subcommittees um, open to the idea of meeting on a, on a monthly basis, taking into account some of the recommendations that um, members have shared. And if this preliminary division of, of kind of a proposal for agendas for each of those monthly meetings feels about right to get to the, the subcommittee to a place to be able to draft recommendations by June. I see it works for me from Marsha, thanks. So, sorry, just wanted a clarification. Does that mean so we're looking between April and July and kind of having whatever sessions or of feedback provided by the community? Is that what we're looking into? So those will be other meetings added to this schedule between April and July, correct? So these would be subcommittee meetings in addition to um, task force meetings that are already on the calendar. Okay, because I, I think, I understood your just question. my feedback was, well, I think as we're looking at methods for receiving public input, that there are gonna be the multiple sessions in which task force members should be a part of that are gonna be their focus groups um, between that April timeline and then the review of the draft recommendations. Um, like, are we accounting for that within this calendar? I think that's probably the timeline that we'll have then to do further focus groups and feedback and sort of really being able to get a thorough in input from community members outside of just this discussion meeting. I mean, certainly this calendar doesn't reflect that the specific um, recommendation for, for focus groups. So I think this could be an opportunity to kind of reassess or move things around so that that could be part of the plan if that's supported by the, the subcommittee. maybe just posing a kind of specific logistical question do you think it would be valuable to kind of have some of the preliminary discussions that we outlined on specific topics like meeting time notice outreach tools etc before or after those focus groups do, do you kind of want to do focus groups to hear from the public first and then reflect on what you heard or have some conversations to frame the questions i, I think we can <laughs> this is your schedule right so we can do whatever you think makes sense but um just let us let us know and we can kind of build that in yeah i will say that at times you know this kind of boards and commissions need and then they will have preset kind of expectations or thoughts of how this should be handled and sort of sometimes those questions can be deliver that that in the community to fit what the you know the file or like the beliefs of the committee or the commission uh, so I think being able to get feedback from the community ahead of us, even making any decisions, because if not, it doesn't seem like authentic, true, trustworthy outreach that is just sort of like a box that we're, you know, marking. Uh, what else I see Ian's hand up? Well, I'm, I'm, my question is more about why is this on a compressed timeline compared to the other, um, you know, when they're coming, recommendations are coming in November, and then this would end in July. Is it hopes to get this this part done sooner and then people can participate in the others like the health equity analysis, I guess i'm curious as to the compressed timeline. Um, just so just to make note this timeline ideally would go through um, November when the when the uh, report is due the only reason that we put this here um, through July is that we would want to maybe reassess exactly how we are holding these meetings in the summer. Um, June being kind of like the next like 
major deadline that we have in terms of developing at least a draft of recommendations. So yeah, apologies if this is confusing because this will go on. This is not a more compressed timeline compared to any other subcommittee. Um, but you know, we kind of laid out here what we what we thought we could review in every monthly meeting. But like this is this is a total draft. This is kind of like what came out of um, Natalie and mine's minds, and we stuck it on a slide. So at least we had a starting point. Um, but in terms of like when we meet, the content, um, you know, exactly who we invite to these meetings, kind of Ilda, as you mentioned, like doing multiple meetings in the months of April and May, you know, focusing on those focus groups and um, doing smaller meetings that like maybe just some members of this task force would attend. All of that is up for um, planning. You know, we can, you all kind of let us know exactly what you think would be the best model and we'll make it happen. And Lubna, I'll, I'll just really quickly weigh in to add the, the reason we want all the subcommittees and not just this one, and what we hope we can encourage all the subcommittees to stay on this time frame is to have draft recommendations in June is that once we have draft rec recommendations from all the subcommittees, we'll have to take those recommendations to the full task force, right? And, and you all will get to kind of see what the other subcommittees recommend, kind of discuss changes, et cetera. And then we, we need lots of time to get feedback from the public on, on whatever draft recommendations we set up. And so that, that's why we have this ambitious timeline is we want plenty of time for there to be one kind of some task force agreement and, and two, um, an opportunity for the public to weigh in on all those ideas before November and potentially even multiple rounds of, of feedback, right? Um, you know, if we can evolve over time. So, so the idea is really trying to get something on paper early so that there's plenty of time for kind of that broader reflection from the kind of June to November timeline. So I hope that kind of answers your question, Ian, about why we're, why we have June in mind. Yeah, my question's answered there, and that kind of makes sense to me. This being the first subcommittee meeting is kind of the first idea I've seen of a, a longer timeline and how the components fit in. So in terms of next steps here, Lubna, do we want to get, I mean, I think thinking about where focus groups might, or more focus conversations might fit in, we might want to weave that in, but I'm also wondering if that's something maybe we can um, work on together and, and share a revised draft for consideration by the subcommittee so we have some time to do a chair election. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, this is, this is kind of, we get that this is the first time you're like looking at this timeline and even considering any of this. So um, one thing I will just ask of, of all the task force members here is just to, to continue to stay engaged um, over, I mean, really for the whole year, but um, for the next few weeks as we're planning this out, if there are like concrete ideas that you wanna put in writing and send to me, um, please do so. I can also create kind of um, like a Google doc that we can put in our shared drive where people can, can contribute that way. Um, Joel, I'll probably wanna discuss kind of some of the logistics of that just to make sure that we are complying with um, open meetings law um, and kind of the best way to do that where um, not everybody's just coming in and editing the document um, with anything they wanna put in there. So. Um, something, some kind of central document that we all can work in that way, when you all do have kind of a moment in your week to kind of sit down and, and look at exactly how you want your, your subcommittee to be rolled out over the, over the next year, um, that you can, you can share those thoughts then. So um, I'll follow up with, with kind of some materials and what I think um, would be a good structure for you all to go off of. Um, but content-wise, um, please do uh, continue to share your ideas and content. Um, so yeah, with that said, we have about 10, a little less than 10 minutes left. Um, so Natalie, should we go ahead and, and shift yeah. gears into our- Sounds great. Um, great. 
Um, and so Lubna, I'm not sure, I, I think maybe you understood the process better than I in terms of kind of how we want to invite either um, self nominations or um, nominations of others for a chair. Yeah, yeah. So um, at this time, I mean, this is a pretty um, informal process. Um, you all are familiar with kind of how we introduce this during the first task force meeting. But if we are looking at the language from our bylaws, um, we do say that for every subcommittee, we will elect um, a chairperson. And so um, if anybody wants to go ahead and nominate others or self-nominate, um, I welcome that right now. You can drop something in the chat or you can just come off mute and say, hey, I, I would love to run for chair or I think this person should run for chair. Um, and once we have, um, our nominations collected in the next couple of minutes. Um, we'll just go through a voting process. Um, and if there are multiple people that want to run, um, we will do it um, by secret ballot. So meaning if, um, if there are multiple people that are nominated, multiple people running, um, we will go ahead and vote and you can put your vote um, into a direct chat message to Joel um, and Joel will tally up those votes. Um, we have a question okay. from Ian. Yeah. I, I just wanted to remind the other members, that as, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that the conversation about whether they wanted to do co-chairs here too was going to be discussed independently inside the subcommittees. And so I just want to make sure all those options still remain on the table that we had talked about from back then. Yeah, sure. Um, we can definitely consider um, doing uh, co-chairs. Um, I think what we had what we had laid out in the bylaws were we had shifted to doing co-chairs for the entire task force meeting. What is in the current bylaw writing is that we would have a chairperson for each subcommittee. We can, everything is subject to change. So if, if you all feel like this subcommittee needs two chairs, we can definitely exhibit that model. Um, there are, uh, let's see, there are six people, seven people on this subcommittee. Um, so, you know, whether a co-chair model, you know, if that feels like it makes the most sense, um, that is totally fine. Um, the reason I had just suggested a chair is because that is a kind of a smaller number, but open to whatever task force members think here. Okay, so um, we are, I'll give folks just a few more seconds to um, nominate. Um, the one person that we have in the running is Ilda. So um, if anybody else would like to run, um, please share that with us now. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other nominations coming through, um, and it looks like uh, a lot of folks love Ilda, which I do too. <laughs> um, so I think um, if we we don't necessarily have to go through um, a secret ballot, considering there's only one person. Um, so if we can just do um, a vote, and I can just do kind of a a quick um, uh, call on people's names, and then if you can. Uh, state whether you would like to vote for Ilda, yes or no, um, we can just do it that way. Um, Maybe let's just check that Ilda would like to be chair, would like to accept the nomination. <laughs> yes, I would love to accept the nomination. I'm oh, self-nominating myself to love now. We had chat <laughs> too, so I appreciate it, folks. Thank you so much for putting your trust in me for this role. All right, um, so I'm just gonna do a quick uh, roll call and uh, if I could just get a yay or nay, um, that would Let's be just great. Check. Ian, do you have another question? Uh, uh, I don't, I, this is a, this came up in the last meeting as well about what would uh, task force members be able to vote on committees um, if they show up to them or not? And I remember that was a question. And so I just was curious of what people think about um, letting people vote. Um, like I told you in the meeting we had before when I worked for Denver City Council, only the, the uh, president of city council actually had that authority. So I, I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there because I, I think, you know, if anybody does show up extra to, to let them have space seems cool to me. But 
I'm open to whatever, really. Um, yeah, and I, I think I will try to answer that because I'm kind of our, our bylaws um, person. So I think what is in the draft bylaws is um, is, is that only the subcommittee members get a, a vote, but uh, but all task force members can participate in, in every subcommittee if they choose, like, like you're doing. Um, and I don't remember making that change. I, I thought where we left it, uh, the main feedback of the task force um, in December was to kind of keep that structure, like like you said, where kind of like just the subcommittee members vote, but um, any task force member can participate. But also the full task force hasn't ratified the bylaws yet, um, which means that we have a little more flexibility. If, if this group thinks we should take a different structure, we, we certainly can. and then bring that to the back to the full task force to decide on in, in February. So I guess it, it's a bit of a question for you all. And maybe the operative question is, um, you know, do, do you think it would be better for any member of the task force present to have a vote or just kind of the formal subcommittee members, the people designated on the subcommittee? If this will be a change to the bylaws, should we bring it up to the task force then? Because then it would affect all the all the different subcommittees, correct? Yeah. So I I guess you know we we had the great discussion in December about changes to the bylaws. So we've been working on making all those changes based on your feedback, and we'll kind of present a draft for you all to review that reflects all those changes and in a couple of cases like multiple options, right? Because it seems like there were multiple options for how you all wanted to make decisions and then ask ask the full task force to make formal decisions and and adopt the bylaws and choose among those options at the February meeting. So um, so if, if you all kind of on more reflection or now that we're in a subcommittee meeting, you're like, you know, I really think any subcommittee member present should be able to vote in a subcommittee meeting, for example, we could make that edit to the bylaw for, for review and sort of adoption at the February meeting. Um, or we could present multiple options of the discussion point at the February meeting. Um, really, our job is to take what we hear in these meetings and from all of you and kind of bring it to the whole task force for a decision in February. Does that um, answer your question? Definitely. So then, uh, do folks feel comfortable in bringing this up as sort of the bylaws uh, edited versions are presented and then? Maybe the first meeting of some of the task force will be, sorry, the subcommittees of the task force will be only by task force members and then be able to look at extending it to task force members joining the meeting. Could that be just presented as a vote in our next meeting? Absolutely, yeah. Great, love it. Okay, great. Um, and so uh, I'm just gonna do a quick uh, check on, uh, votes. So um, could I just get a yay or nay on the um, election of Ilda um, for the chair of uh, this subcommittee? And I see that, um, okay, Mara, Mar, I see you're, um, you seconded Ilda. Um, so we have Marsha, Dominique, Mara, um, Jaime, and um, Jonathan. Okay, great. That is everybody. Congratulations, Isla, on being the chair of um, Best Practices for Community Engagement Subcommittee. It's exciting. You are the first chair um, for the entire task force. There's not even a chair for, or co-chairs for the actual task force yet. So um, this is great. Um, Okay, so we are at four o'clock. Um, Natalie, if you wanna, sorry, I kind of took over um, facilitation, um, but if you wanna go ahead and kind of close this out. No, just to say thanks to everyone. I don't wanna extend our time any longer, but I've just really appreciated this conversation. And I think it's such a great opportunity to be able to think these processes through and, and think about how we can um, achieve meaningful engagement and bring about the kind of change that we envision and is um, called for under the Environmental Justice Act. So thanks for all the input and then this conversation and look forward to our next meetings with all of you. 
Yes, and then um, please just look out for any communications from me for scheduling the next um, subcommittee meeting for uh, for this subcommittee in particular. Um, but until then, uh, we will see you, some of you at another subcommittee meeting um, in the next uh, couple of weeks and others um, will see you at the full task force meeting on February 22nd. Thanks so much for your time all. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye. Bye folks, thank you so much. Have a good one.